Hi and welcome to Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. I'm JJ Walsh, your host based in Hiroshima, Japan. And in this episode, I have a chance to catch up with James Hollow, who is the CEO of Fabric, a Tokyo based consultancy and uh, business very focused on sustainability. And we're talking about their third set of data. They've done three years in a row to try to find out how Japanese consumers think about sustainable brands, sustainable products, and sustainable lifestyle.、Um, so, the title of this year's Sustainability in Japan number three is The Pathway to Regenerative Business. And different from previous years, there's、uh, more focus on the idea of how happy people are、uh, working. At the moment, and how that differs depending on generations. Also, the idea of wellness, inclusion,、uh, social impact aspects, as well as、uh, environmental aspects. So, I've had the chance to talk with James about previous studies, and this third time、uh, they decided to have a big event as well, which I was able to go to in Tokyo, and that was a great chance. To not only meet James and his team at Fabric, who are doing such great work, but also to listen to some of the people from business who are talking about sustainable finance and、uh, how they are putting into action sustainable strategies in their businesses or different case studies. So that was a fantastic event. And、uh, in this episode, he's Talking a bit about the event as well as the data and how they did their research and what comparisons they're able to make looking at the research three different years in a row. So I hope you enjoy it. And as always, thanks for listening. And if you have any comments or questions, please make sure to reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter and Blue Sky. And、uh, threads at JJ Walsh, and you can find me at Instagram, Facebook, and on LinkedIn as well as Inbound Ambassador. I'd love to hear from you, and I'm sure James would be happy to reply as well. Your company, you are CEO of Fabric. It is a very sustainability focused consultancy and it's very data driven. And you guys are doing that data collection to really understand how consumers think about sustainable brands. Is that right? Yeah, thanks, Joy.、Um, that's correct. So, Fabric is a strategic design and sustainability consultancy. So,、um, we, sustainability is definitely a specialism of ours, what, but we're applying a strategic design method to everything that we do. Um, and strategic design really starts with understanding the problem space or the opportunity space that you're working within.、Um, and we really put a focus on the human experience in that, so a human centered design approach.、Um, and by doing that, you know, you really you sort of put yourself in the, in the、um, position of、um, the consumers or the employees and really trying to understand what it looks like from their point of view.、Um, and it, often some of the things which maybe look Strange or hard to understand when you see it from their point of view, actually, you can understand why, for instance, they're not adopting certain behaviors or why they're sort of choosing some things and not others.、Um, so, we do have a very、um, research focused approach, and obviously, data is really important in that. I'd also just think, you know, stories are really important too.、Um, so, not that we make them up, but we synthesize all of the research from data, from the interviews that we do,、um, and then turn those into narratives that help explain what's really going on. And those Those narratives are really、um, important because they help, you know, that, that's how ideas get adopted, understood,、um, and popularized. So that sort of whole thing is part of what Fabric does.、Um, but yeah, and it's great to have this chance again to share some of, some of the,、uh, the data and the stories coming out of our, our work in,、uh, this year. Yeah, we're going to dive right into some of the key topics in this year、um, cool. and how, how it's progressing and changing over the last three years because you've, you've been doing it since 2021.、This、yeah, it's crazy. The third it's... year, my goodness. It must take most of, most of the year planning and, and carrying out the research. Oh, my God. Well, so, luckily, some of it is we're just rolling over because we want to keep the.、Uh, You know, the consistency to track the changes、um, kind of、uh, rigorously.、Um, but yeah, we have done a lot of new work. And I think one of the 
um, one of the things we found coming out of last year was that um, we, you know, this 2021 was basically the baseline. So where's Japan at when it comes to sustainability? Um, and there's this um, kind of profile of the population against levels of it, of consciousness towards sustainability. Um, and most people we found to be at a low level, essentially. That, that And by that, we mean that in their day-to-day -day interactions with brands, when they go to the supermarket and choose brands, when they're online shopping, um, but also in their, you know, lifestyle habits as well they're not thinking that much about sustainability or value those values are not coming into their decision making um, but we also found people at the other end who are really engaged with sustainability um, who think about it a lot and maybe pretty much all of their brand choices a lot of their lifestyle is around reducing their impact and maybe trying to have more of a positive impact through the choices that they're making um, and so what we've been trying to do is essentially track the the shift um, towards that that sort of uh, society where where you know where we've got to get to essentially is where more and more people are thinking in that way. Um, so yeah, so the um, what we found I think last year is that with with that second study compared to the baseline is that steadily Japanese people are moving towards um, higher higher levels of consciousness. Um, but the kind of pace of change is in the sort of like let's say under five percent per year. Um, so it's not something that's probably fast enough for Japan, for instance, to hit its own um, transition goals. And so we asked the question, well, what would it take would it, for, for the Japanese population to be able to move faster? And to answer that, you kind of get into what are the barriers that people are facing? Um, and that specific question wasn't one that we, we, we sort of uh, tackled head on, um, but we did get various signals around it. And um, we use this word, this Japanese word yo yu um, as a way of sort of capturing that um, because there were various sort of pictures that emerged of people at the high consciousness end versus the people at the low consciousness end and the high consciousness people tended to be um, it, we didn't find it to be in a kind of uh, let's say just a financial privilege um, there was some slight sort of bias towards higher income but it was really quite small and not really sort of one that would statistically you'd call um, you know determinative um, but things like having the time to read and absorb lots of information, um, being actually engaged with lots of brands and, in, and getting and being welcome to um, sort of advertising from brands or particularly ones that you, you're interested in. Um, and overall, a kind of picture of a really engaged consumer. And that's kind of was slightly surprising because um, in the West and I think, you know, particularly, let's say, North America and Europe, that sort of really, um, we imagine the sort of Greta Thunberg, Gen Z activist mindset driving sustainable transitions. Um, and whether that's true or not, it's it really isn't true in Japan. The people who are engaging most with sustainable propositions are actually really engaged consumers who are not rejecting capitalism. They're not rejecting consumerism. They're fully engaged with it. Um, and so I guess so people have been studying Japanese society may not be so surprised that the transition is likely to be one in Japan where people are moving together with each other, but also with big companies and with you know, the institutions and governments towards this future, rather than it being this kind of disruptive change with new startups coming in and challenging the status quo. We will see some of that, but it's not going to be that kind of disruptive activist driven transition. Um, so that's something that um, we were also wanted to validate with this year, this year's work, and also understand so what are those barriers. Um, 60, I think, if you get up the graph that shows that sort of population curve, the, the number of people in that low group is coming down every year. Um, and it's going towards sort of like 58% in the low group now, um, with most of the rest in the, the higher um, consciousness ends. Um, but that's still the the majority of the population are sort of basically not that switched on to sustainability in their daily life. Um, and we had a hypothesis that that was to do with um, their their sort of uh, this yo-yo idea. And we tried to address that formally by looking at their well, well-being levels and self-rated well-being across eight different dimensions. Um, and yeah, the, the sort of upshot of that is that we found that essentially our hypothesis seems to be correct that lots of people and this is connected to their working environments and this is a working context are um essentially just 
struggling to look after themselves and get themselves to a sort of um, to the point of um, sufficient well-being to be engaging with um, new stuff. So yeah, thanks for flashing up these this data. So this is um, some of the other things we're tracking here, like what's important to you when selecting a company at work. This is looking at people's kind of values towards that. Um, and people are quite value driven in that um, that selection. But obviously, in Japan, compared to other companies, they tend to change jobs less often. Um, and we really see a difference in the generations there. So if we use the Western sort of definition of, uh, of sort of those cohorts, population cohorts at different age groups, the baby boomers, um, Gen X, millennials, and then the youngest, the Gen Z, we find that the top three tiers are quite sort of um, still essentially hanging on to the traditional attitude towards um, employer, em your employer. Um, and it's essentially somewhere where, you know, you really stick it out, even if the company is not changing the way you want it to, or you're, you know, it's not giving you the kind of balance, work-life balance or well-being levels that you'd want, you'd stick it out. But actually the younger generation, the Gen Z, we're seeing quite a big generational split there where they are basically saying, if these conditions aren't working for me, I'm going to leave. Um, and I think that's, um, we've seen because of the way that Japan does these transitions, we see a big role for employers um, to educate, to engage with, and to sort of support um, the their employees shift towards sustainable lifestyle. Um, but um, they may need to move a bit faster on that. Um, and the Gen Z cohorts within their companies um, will not hang around forever waiting them for, to make those changes. And when we're talking about that, yeah, the majority of Japanese, you know, after our, our work and we do a very sort of robust um, quantitative study that's representative of Japan across all geographies, all age groups. Um, and these underlying structural reasons um, are really key to it. So the seniority based um, promotion structure in Japan, basically your salary compensation and your seniority depend on how long you've been there not on you know basically it's not a meritocracy not on your performance um that's been a sort of let's say um a constant and a sort of seen as something that's ensured security for japanese society um and hence many of the leaders who are kind of supporting that still are maybe feeling that they're doing a, the right thing for japanese society by not changing it um, the Gen Z are basically calling that out and saying, well, that doesn't work for me. I'm not going to wait here 30 years so I can, you know, have that salary at that position. It's just not something I can commit to. Um, and yeah, it's, I think in that sense, um, there, that this demographic sort of pressure on Japan, um, where you've got a, a decreasing birth rate and hence a, a much sort of smaller um, Gen Z population than in previous generations, that may, basically means in the labor market, it's a kind of labor seller's market. And the buyers, the employers, are going to have to work much harder to keep them. And I think, you know, what part of um, our work suggests that actually that's going to be one of the ma major drivers of change in policy towards employees. And also then towards, you know, these issues which connect really directly back to sustainability, like well-being, um, like um, equal, equal equal opportunities um, for females. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the big trend overview picture. Um, I'll pause there in case you um, want to dive into any of those areas. There's so many interesting points to talk about, but I think this year uh, your data did have these new uh, elements to focus on about well-being, about tipping points as well, I found really interesting. And not only the consumer surveys that you did, but also really interesting in-depth interviews are included in your uh, magazine publication. What do you call it? Yeah, it's I guess it's a book now. It's, it's a book, yeah. 250 pages. So let me put, just um, share with, with your um, followers, Joy, that we've got. So every year we do put it out. This year we've we've made a 250 page book, which is available for download as an ebook for free. Um, it's bilingual um, and it includes um, basically explanations of the data that we found and the trends that we're watching, as well as um, these interviews with um, about a dozen thought leaders um, who've who've brought their sort of really insightful perspectives um, to this theme. 
Um, and most of those uh, who are work in business um, from running extremely large companies like um, Jin Montesano, who's the um, chief chief people officer at Lixil, um, Eriko Suzuki, who's the um, founder of Kind Capital, um, a fund which focuses on sort of really being aware of well-being and um, the how how the companies that they invest in are um, are thinking in terms of the social dimensions of sustainability, not least with their own people. Um, from academics, um, people working in, who are driving startups. So it's a really interesting mix of perspectives, um, all sort of focusing on this nexus of um, of the, of work and well-being and how that is either enabling or, or holding back a kind of a broader sustainable um, transition for society. Uh, I will put the link right now um, and it's on the Fabric website. So if you sign up, uh, you can download your own copy. I love that you you guys have made it bilingual, completely Japanese and, and English bilingual, but also all the easy to follow graphs. Uh, so you can follow the, how the data is changing over the years, um, the interviews, great photos and graphics. But just making it available and accessible to everyone. This is kind of rare in sustainable research uh, in Japan and around the world. And it's so valuable for people across many different kinds of industries. And you must use it in your own consulting work as well, right? Yeah, no, so Fab Fabric is, um, we're a for-profit company, but we, were fa we founded ourselves with um, a mission to, to kind of give back to the community and to sort of really um, you know, part of the fabric metaphor is we wanted to interweave ourselves with um, with our community and with the the, the other change makers um, who are making who are driving innovation in in the you know towards the right side of history, and um, we basically committed to doing this study and for making all of the data and the results public so that other people in our community and any change maker who's trying to get something going in an organization could have the data to back up their case and say, well, this is what this is the reality. Whatever you may have sort of heard through rumors, this is actually what's going on. Um, so that's, you know, one of the ways that is part of our community program and, and sort of contribution. Um, and so we'd love it if people, you know, um, downloaded that um, used it in their work. Um, I think we're, um, we're going to be working with some academics outside of Japan who look very specifically at well-being in the workplace um, with our SJ3 data. Um, we've made it available for NGOs and nonprofits um, before so that they can use it when they're going engaging with with um, potential partners and clients. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a big part of it. Um, thank you for liking the designs. Like, um, obviously, we really pride ourselves on the quality of the communication. It's super important because, you know, basically dry stuff isn't as you know isn't as compelling and doesn't drive the imagination. So, um, our visual designers and um, strategists who have written it um, and made the graphs, you know, visualizations really um, interesting. Yeah, we I'm very grateful to you guys. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, I get to talk about it, but they, they've done all the hard work to make it such um, a beautiful and compelling piece piece of communication. So we're really proud of that. Um, the There is going to be a, a physical copy. Um, we've been working with um, a Okawa printers in Japan who actually have a zero carbon um, printing service. Um, so without any of the guilt of a 250 page uh, book, um, the you can get hold of you will be able to get hold of a um a hard copy and anyone who buys a ticket to the event on the 30th will get one as part of the kind of event pack um as complimentary so yeah we're we're proud of that too it's a really it's going to be hopefully a really inspiring artifact for people to have um around them in their places of work and uh, and creativity yeah it's awesome it's really an important legacy that you are doing at Fabric. It's not, it's it's kind of how I think about this talk show too, right? It's, it's always gonna be there uh, for people to access as a part of history where we are when we're talking about sustainability right now in Japan. And I think you're really doing that with your work with Fabric and collecting data and consulting and sharing it with the public as well. So thank you so much for your team and you, James, for all well, the work you're thanks. doing. Thanks, I'm gonna, you're gonna get me teary here. I'm, no, I mean, but also, um, you know, 
chapeau to you, Joy, for all, I mean, you're an inspiration to me as we, you know, as I set up Fabric and got it going, um, what you've done off your own back, you know, has been incredible. And I really congratulate you and are grateful for all your efforts. Um, this has got to be a team game, right? So I think, you know, what with Fabric we're trying to do is, is, um, is show that we can be a, you know, really strong strong profitable business but do it in a, in a different way and sort of live and breathe and walk the talk on on a sustainable model um, and so we're always trying out new stuff like in our office um, we use we have we have a, a worm composting system in our office um, that's obviously reducing our, our sort of uh, our waste but also helping um, our team and any guests we have come in get familiar with the idea of you know putting of recycling um, nutrients back into a soil and, and using that um, to grow new stuff. We have um, zero plastic um, station, like a hub, a refill station where you can bring in um, reusable, you know, basically kind of um, containers and fill up with um, shampoo, body wash, detergents, so that you can remove plastic from um, from that area, that area of your sort of of your life. Um, and basically, we're trying lots of different things to encourage a more sustainable lifestyle and kind of weaving that into the experience of being part of our team and community. So you've That's been awesome. You're you're walking the walk. You're well, not we just to. talking the talk. I love it. <laughs> we try to. We've got some good questions coming in as well, I think. Yeah, That's yeah. So cool. uh, we want to give a shout out to Real World Japan. Thanks for your comments on YouTube. Uh, talking about the legacy of Hiroshima business style. Now, in your report, you do talk about Sampo Yoshi and Yoyo, Yayoi, Yoyoi, sorry, I'm saying it wrong, um, but the idea of, of well, well-being, feeling of well-being, but also the hierarchy and the dissatisfaction that a lot of young people are feeling uh, for the seniority, like you talked about before. So talking about it, dating back to World War II, yeah. I would say I would say even further back because it it connects to the apprenticeship system in Japan and uh, being a sword maker it it dates back well beyond there right yeah no thanks thanks very much real real Japan I think you might be more clued up than me on this what one of our interviewees um, told us was that that system dates back to the pre-war sort of the the military um, nationalist era in the sort of 20s and 30s when they were basically looking at what does a militarized society look like and particularly with the sort of the, the progression of um, male military careers and had to sort of map where someone how many family how many children they need to be supporting at the age of like the, by 35 versus 45 and then sort of basically map that to income um, and created this hierarch hierarchical system that was then basically projected from the military back onto civil society and business. Um, and that system was um, was was sort of uh, became the norm. I didn't know the context with Mac with MacArthur and that era, but um, I think culturally it stayed there because essentially it feels um, like a it's social security. It sort of feels like the um, it, it's a, a rock on which society can sort of, you know, um, anchor itself in terms of that predictability. Um, but it's, I, you know, and I think so often people look at that and, and various aspects of Japanese culture and think, oh, that's so stupid, that's so dumb, why would they do it like that? But it's actually, you know, in its own, in this context, it's worked very well for a long time. I mean, Japan's been an economic miracle, um, certainly up to the bubble. And even since, I think, Japan's man managed that post bubble economy. You know, in ways that I think the uh, other countries, as they as they sort of um, face a sort of you know post-industrial era, will increasingly come to appreciate as basically being pretty well managed. Um, but we really feel that that system has just got to go, um, and it, it's holding too many important changes back now. Um, and I think you know it, it is going to change. If you look at say the interview with Jin Montesano, chief people officer at Lixil. They no longer run that system. Um, yeah, there's Jin, and she. So um, what Jin and her team are doing is is taking a really sort of insight-based approach, a very human-centric, humanist approach to transitioning a massive global organisation towards that, and particularly that that context here in Japan, um, to a more meritocratic system. And um, I think you could read um, read up on what Jin said that in our report. 
Um, but you know, many companies in Japan, um, the Toyotas, Panasonics, you know, they they're still grappling with that. They haven't really started on that transition, although they have started on lots of other things. Um, um, and then you have the sort of startup scene where you've got ventures which are sort of starting out and wondering, okay, should we be modeling ourselves on a Silicon Valley company or modeling ourselves on, you know, trying to be the next sort of Panaso Panasonic or Toyota or these, and, you know, working out what kind of systems they need for that um, and what kind of people pro programs. And, you know, I think Japan will synthesize this combination of, of the traditional and the modern, referencing the, you know, international best practices and what's, what's worked there, but also doing to be honest, continuing to to find its own own path there, there, we definitely see it moving away from the traditional models, but not necessarily just snapping um, to be in line with what's happening elsewhere either. Yeah, so interesting. I've also linked your Medium article, so you have uh, taken some of the the key points from the the big summary of data, and you've written some great articles on Medium. Um, so that's that's worth following and and getting a little insight uh, if you're not going to take on the 120 plus yeah. pages. Yeah, um, but, thanks so yeah. much. Yeah, it's a good place to dip in. We we sort of um, pre-released some of the articles on there, and that that channel is something that will be we publish to um, stuff that's not even in that report. But actually, everything right now that's on that medium, they'll all be in the report. So if you download the uh, the the ebook, um, they'll all be contained within that. Um, but yeah, please do follow us on Medium as well, um, and uh, LinkedIn and Instagram. We're we're active too, as well as as Twitter. Awesome. And bef before we move on too much, I think one of the the key indicators or key takeaways from your report was about how younger generations are are really concerned with gender equality in Japan, and this is a huge issue in Japan still. The latest government uh, is all completely 100% men, uh, the manal. And this is, you know, hasn't happened since 2001. But James, when you do the report, when you have your event, we notice people who notice these things. We notice your, your walk in the walk and showing how gender equality, gender balance is really important. And thank you so much for that. We need more of it. Yeah, I mean, don't thank me. I mean, it's the it's the brilliant thought leaders that you know we've we've lined up. You should be thanking. It's 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 just a shame that, like you say, there's so many events happen where um, they just essentially s stick with the old boy, the old guy networks, and you know they they're not representing a a, a a completely balanced perspective from that. And that has been. Yeah, that does really need to change at all levels. I mean, if you, if you look at, there's a couple of, um, we we look every year, look at this um, people's understanding essentially of their literacy with the SDGs. I don't know if you've um, got that to hand, but um, if, yeah, there we go. So if you look at Japan's top five issues as um, according to the UN SDGs indices, um, you've got, th so this is from the middle at the top is number one, um, that sort of uh, life underwater, action on climate change is number two, which is good alignment because they're also in the top five kind of priorities or top, um, for, for Japan as a nation. Um, if you look at gender equality, number five, it's down there in 13th place. Um, now, when I say 13th place, that means when we ask Japanese people, um, what which of these concepts do you associate with the term sustainability or jizokan also in Japanese, um, without referencing SDGs or anything, um, this is what they say. They basically, thirty-five percent, and you could see, look at this and think, well, only thirty-five point seven percent associate um, life underwater or climate, you know, action on climate, thirty-five percent with with sustainability. Um, but that's because this is a new kind of cultural import. You know, Japan's been aware of sustainability issues for a long time. I mean, the whole in, issue of depopulation in in rural Japan, that's a sustainability issue. It just hasn't been called that word, and so. The SDGs, that framing and this definition for sustain, this globalized framing of sustainability is, is a new thing and it's come in um, and Japan's still catching up. Now, obviously, look, government, this is SDGs, is a, is a national um, uh, sort of set of a goals framework for, for countries, but companies have also jumped on it. 
but actually they need all of society because this is how japan works to kind of come along with it and so to some extent everyone needs to be aware of this the reasons behind it what it connects to and so this sort of literacy and engagement with this is actually a really important factor and the great news is that it's growing like quite quickly um so if you look at that plus the plus 11 12 13 percent this is we're seeing a really strong growth year on year of the number of people who associate these concepts with this idea of sustainability we think that's th through at last the work of the media the wide shows covering this people may be hearing about it through work um so this is really good but to your point on gender equality only 25 percent of people really link that to sustainability um and so that's going to take a lot more work. And even so when you split this between men and women, um, something like I think 20 percent of men link it and then only 20 percent of women. So for a lot of the, the population, including the female population, this is that these two issues are not seen as sort of like level. Or they d maybe don't see a gender equality issue in Japanese society. There was also when we look at that by gender. Oh, sorry. When you look at that by generation, um, when you've got those four generations, um, we see a sort of a more environmental bias at the at the higher um, age range um, where they're sort of looking more at climate change being ex existential risk um, that taking action is really important um, and that's also true of the younger generations but number one of their concerns is actually um, equitable pay not across gender but just like for themselves like having enough having for pe for their incomes to be um, essentially fair in the context of society and so financial well-being um having being paid enough money to sort of have the life that you you want to live that's seen as being the number one sort of sustainable sustainable issue for younger generations which is really telling um and important because until you sort of fix these basic needs on, on well-being and there are some other dimensions we looked at as well it's going to be hard to persuade people that they should you know take other actions um that lead to um let's say having a lesson in an impact on the environment or making changes that will require some thought and engagement from their part so um and the role of companies in that is really crucial um you know it's not like the companies don't have cash they're sitting you know the big japanese companies have 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 done very well sort of in the um abenomics era they've their coffers are full of cash. It's not that they can't pay it, they just don't have that as a priority. Um, so, you know, hopefully our work will contribute that to actually, if you want to have happy employee, you know, happy, productive, creative, imaginative employees, imagining a new future for, for company, society, and their own lives, you're gonna actually have to meet some of their more basic needs, like paying them a bit more, but also really in, enabling them to, to feel a greater sense of um, emotional security, to feel even as females or as other um, marginalized minorities really embraced and accepted um, and then you get into that whole the whole DEI space which is again another area where um, Japanese companies you know some of the some, some companies do a very good job on this in Japan it's definitely is an in increasingly important issue um, it's also crucially I think being seen um, through the ESG framework of you know the ESG is kind of how investors measure um, the risk that certain business models are carrying um, as they move into a more, you know, basically a future where the context is fr context is framed around environment for E, um, sort of so society um, and governance. And if they aren't able to adapt to change, they aren't able to sort of come up with new ideas and and shift. Then that's a risky investment because they're going to have to. And you know, there's very robust work that shows that um, the more diverse points of view you have in an organization um, and the better the well-being of that of that em the, that employee team, the more able they are to embrace change, to be creative, to come up with new solutions. Um, and so investors, particularly outside Japan, are starting to see that S score um, and the and DEI in particular as kind of um, a proxy for ability to innovate um, and you could you know so that's a really significant thing because you could kind of you know diversity is a bit of a num is a bit of a, you can almost do that by numbers you know by you know but actually in terms of culture in order to get everyone feeling like they belong there and hence emotionally safe to be able to actually engage collaboratively 
creatively in innovation and drive positive change, not just for sustainable agendas, but just actually to to create new growth and to find new areas of um, sort of shared value with your customers that can drive competitive advantage. These things require require you know that that um, employee base to be in a good place um, and to be able to work collaboratively with them. So that and that's really dependent on in, the feeling of inclusion. Um, some companies now include um, DEIB, belonging, the sense of belonging. Um, and some some investors, and you know, I've, I've spoken to them, met them, are looking at Japanese companies and thinking, okay, well, if they can't shift that, then I don't, I'm not going to bet on them to be able to um, to sort of change. Um, in many other ways, Japanese companies are really strong and and seen as really um, a sort of a good bet in in a you know in a global context. And the Japanese economy, with actually very strong regulation, transparency, and you know lots of standardized accounting practices, etc., is a very um, good bet. And you see that from inbound investment. Um, but in this area of human capital, um, that's an area where there's increasing focus, and hence, you know, that's one of the reasons we've been looking at this area in particular for our report, and we'll be talking more about it on the 30th. Yeah, excellent. So many excellent points. Thanks, James. Uh, we've had some great comments. Um, Darren is asking about how the government response has been in terms of sustainability. Uh, real world Japan, of course, talking about the paradox uh, you have to lift prices, to lift pay, to take care of your your staff. Um, but let's touch on Darren's point, because I think that's one of the things uh, when you do the question about whose responsibility is it? Um, how do consumers consider the government's role in terms of uh, moving sustainability forward. It's quite interesting. Yeah, hey Darren, good to see you. Darren's down in Australia. Um, was really lucky to have the chance to meet him earlier this year. It's a great question. Um, so the government, yeah, so th this question is about who do people see as kind of responsible for addressing social and environmental challenges? And um, no, I, we don't have this data for the US or the, the EU or the UK, but um, it, I suggest it might look s somewhat different. Um, government is definitely up there, but large companies, um, you know, they are, they are seen as responsible as well, particularly, I think, in Japan as, as employers. Um, the media um, are also up there. Um, and then global organizations and individual people, it's kind of, it's it's lower down, which I think is, I'm not sure how that would exactly be elsewhere, but I think, you know, traditionally, um, foreign corporations, into, like say in the US, when there was a big plastic waste issue first in the 50s, they made it like the the consumer's problem and said, okay, well, this is a recycling trash problem or a trash problem. Whereas I think Japan and Japanese are a little bit more sort of uh, maybe um, realistic and thinking, well, like we're part of a, you know, this isn't a, all about individuals. We're part of a kind of a system here um, and we need the essentially the those with power and authority in this to drive that um, and I think that is fair and so this isn't you know this isn't going to be all about um, putting all of the sort of pressure on people as consumers or as employees or like you know you've got to change your ways to solve this um, that, that's not possible that you know as our study has shown you know most of them are basically just just struggling to get to sort of get along psychologically and and financially or that's how they feel they don't feel like they've got lots of sort of spare capacity to jump on new stuff and engage with it hence that's that you know the idea that that's the biggest barrier but um in terms of the government's commitment so um you know we the the japanese government i think can be um complimented for put showing the right signals so it really does indicate the direction of travel required on carbon, for instance. So it's got its 20, 2050 decarbonization, economic decarbonization program on um, human capital. So the um, the ITO report that it um, commissioned um, and essentially published um, a couple of years ago, um, headed by uh, Professor Ito from Hitotsubashi University, was all about how Japanese big Japanese employers need to come up for the first time with a human capital strategy, which um, focuses on um, how to transform their cultures. Um, it included gen gender and diversity. It included um, sort of 
equity and pay and essentially is challenging that those traditional um, sort of pay pay seniority structures. Um, it didn't really say how though, um, and it didn't put in and and you know, typically the Japanese government will not put through law or regular or sort of regulations into law that that say you must do this by this time. Um, you've seen that say with plastic in France where they've just outlawed disposable plastic. Um, which you know is a great move and and um, well done France for leading on this. Um, I don't think you're going to see that kind of uh, regulatory sort of like the, a lot of the Japan, often the Japan sort of approach don't really have teeth as as policy changes. They're more sort of pushing in that direction and look for public private partnership to then drive towards that. Um, and so that tends to be how things change. So in answer to Darren's question, I think the 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 Japanese governments they 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 do get all this um they they aren't just sort of you know old bureaucrats who don't know what's going on in the world there's a lot of really smart people working towards this but the style of government here and the sort of like contract they have with business and society is not going to be um you know if we look at his historically it's not going to be um new regulations with real teeth it's it's going to be this is the direction we all need to go on let's let's go there together and work together towards that. And so let's say you see with the, the, the I think, third arrow of Abenomics with um, labor reform. Now that hasn't, they, they've been pushing Japanese companies to pay their people more for a long time and they just haven't done it. And that's an example where, um, you know, I think it's the, the weakness of the Japan approach where, you know, something really does need to happen. But when you just, on a systemic level, it's obvious, but then when you're the CEO or the C-suite of one company, um, you know, it's hard when you've got all these different pressures from your to meet your uh, demands for organic growth from your investors, also now ESG scores, also all these things, it's hard for them to sort of, let's say, um, look at it from the systemic point of view, and they'll just maybe think in terms of the next quarter um, and and not take those sort of important changes that are needed for the long term. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. So many great insights there, James. Uh, now, in this report, you talk about tipping points, and there are some like quick takeaways mm. that I just like to touch on. Uh, so, twenty two point eight percent of the people you surveyed said they would like to invest in sustainable companies. And this is uh, sustainable investing is is one of the the key points that you've had uh, from one of the speakers as well, right? Yeah, yeah, particularly on er Erico's um, piece there. I think, so we looked at, within the study, we looked at a bunch of different behaviors. Um, so from doing more, more recycling and sort of being more careful, like say trying to avoid buying plastic or avoid packaging with lots of plastic. And so this idea of sort of motai nai, um, which is like, it's kind of a shame to waste things, right? That's a very traditional Japanese mentality. Um, and we've kind of, most of the changes we've seen where actually new behaviors have been adopted have been in this sort of like incremental changes to behavior, like quite small, small stuff, really important, are needed. Um, but not say I'm going to switch all of my electricity to, to zero carbon electricity or I'm going to buy an, like um, an EV. Um, the, but what we've seen is that lots of people have said I'm interested in that. And so when we talk about tipping points, those incremental changes are important, but they're not going to drive a tipping point in, in say, you know, the, um, the per capita um, carbon intensity of the economy. That's there needs to be some more dramatic changes and so we're trying to measure that um the potential for for more sort of let's say phase changes or sort of you know switching the system over to to let's say from gasoline to ev etc and what we're seeing is that whilst the number of people who've actually adopted that change is in the few percent the number of people who are like i'm kind of interested in that is actually really big it's up to sort of you know depending on which one we're looking at sort of 30 40 percent um and the one you had there was investment in companies so um, that you know, that's a, a, another really interesting indicator that um, this awareness and sort of like potential for change is there. Um, we also had another question. I think it was it came out of the 2022 work where where we asked cons consumers sort of um, a, and we were looking at their agency as consumers and that kind of ability to to like 
to do dollar voting with your purchases. So like, you know, you choose stuff that represents the change you want to see. Um, and the idea of having an impact through your um, consumer choices. And there was, we actually saw that, that this, the kind of peak of that was at the moderate group rather than the high group, which, and, and essentially I want to have an impact, but I don't know how, was at about sort of 40% in that moderate group. In the highest group where, you know, they want to, they even more want to have an impact, right? They're all about trying to have an impact, but they already know how, because they've done the research. They've, they're in communities where they're being shared ideas and recommendations all the time. Um, but that sort of actually peak of that, I want to have an impact, but I don't know how, is kind of a sweet spot for, for brands and businesses to innovate. Because it basically means, well, if you make it easy for me, if you give me a way of having a less of an impact or having a positive impact, I'm going to take that as long as it's not too difficult, too, like Mendelssohn in Japanese, too sort of inconvenient and too expensive, I'll probably still reject it. But if you basically make it easy for me, like I'm down. And so I think this is the challenge. And we, we get really excited about this as designers and business model designers and service and product designers. Like it's an innovation challenge. It's a design challenge. Like the potential in society to flip, you know, really big categories over to much more sustainable practices and models is already there. Um, but the majority are not saying like, oh, I need this right now. Um, they're sort of showing that like, well, make it easy for me and I, I can make it happen. And yeah. so. I, I, I really am interested in, in this, the cost parity, the price parity is a really important concern, right? When you're making that change, the quality and the price, uh, that's long been the case. I was in Ikea in Fukuoka and they had their plant-based fair and everything, all the main things were plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, instead of the usual meat things. And it was amazing to see, you know, there were a few meat options, but everybody was choosing the, the plant-based option because it was new, because it was the same price as they were used to. It looked similar to what they were used to. So I think you're right, James. There's so much opportunity for companies to, to know that information and to make more sustainable options easily available looks like the quality they're used to those kinds of things right totally yeah no i mean pr pricing is really hard to get at in a survey i think you know it's people infamously say oh you know i'll pay a green premium i'll pay a sustainable premium um in a survey but then when push comes to shove in the supermarket or, <clears throat> or restaurant it often doesn't happen um and and you know for and you know for fair enough um but I think the um, things are things are changing, um, and like you say, you see in the food industry um, that kind of new, new um, options coming through that you know essentially are giving people who are ba maybe not ethically or sort of for sustainable values um, demanding um, the change. But when they see it, and it's a kind of oh yeah, I can get I get to say that you know I went no meat today because my friends have been talking about that recently and that's made easy, delicious, accessible and with price parity, then things start to move. Um, and so, you know, that's, some of that could be done just I think with a bit more imagination actually and the kind of changes that you're talking about because so much of the meat that gets consumed, I mean, you, you don't really, it doesn't have to be meat. I mean, even if you're not, right? But then there are other areas where, I mean, actually industrial change does need to happen. I mean, so we talk a lot about plastic waste in Japan. Um, Japan's been dealing with its waste, uh, you know, through incineration um, as a part of a waste to energy system. So um, in the context of an economy that basically gets most of its electricity and, and heat, uh, industrial heat and heating for like say old people's homes and swimming pools through burning fossil fuels um the practice of taking like mixed waste and incinerating it um thereby cleaning up essentially from a hygiene point of view these you know in these massive cities that we have here in japan but also then turning that that heat into electricity and using it for like say local local heating um, is a is actually a pretty sensible practice, and um, it's actually this. If you you know if you look at the West, um, now big economies are sort of 
going over to that system. Um, and but this is the thing you have then with uh, you know Japan has a uh, thermal recycling sort of uh, policy, right? Where um, the official numbers for recycling of PET bottles is really high, but that because it, that's because it includes thermal recycling, which is burning them. So these issues are complex, and so you're shaking your head, and it's you know it, it feels abhorrent to be doing that. But you know if all of your electricity or ninety percent of your electricity is coming from burning fossil fuels, um, then why not burn the plastic waste as well? Yeah. But when it's fed to the public as recycling and it's not really recycling, that's not transparent, that's not honest, that's not the system that we want. That's not for the sure. No, I'm down with that. It, right? And it's not, I mean, to be honest, uh, yeah, it's not really fed to the public. It's more about the, I think, how it's perceived from outside um, and, and how Japan sort of does its numbers for the external sort of frameworks. So, but, no. But internally, too, though, because we often do cleanups. We'll do monthly mm. cleanups on the beach. And I'll talk about how we pick up a lot of pet bottles and uh, they're not less than 18% are actually recycled into anything else. Most of them are burnt. And so many people on social media are like, I had no idea. No, to yeah. totally. And what needs to happen there? I mean, that's why my point was not that we should continue burning. My point was that the, the big system, the big systemic problem is that 90% of the energy still comes from burning fossil fuels. That really needs to change. Pet, you know, pet plastic is a, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful substance. Like this thing is like fossilized carbon. It's actually has incredible robust properties. And so, you know, in all the spectrum of plastics, pet is one that can be recycled. You know, I think you can turn a pet bottle into another pet bottle about 10 times before it gets too cloudy for it to be really, so you, you could look at that as a, as you know, this is, and this is what Jap like Japanese systems trying to do is like, well, we can just recycle pet bottles. Um, and that those, those are cert that's essentially a circular material in the same way that aluminium is for cans. Now, you could also say, well, why, you know, why do we, why do people be needing to buy pet bottles in the first place? Um, you know, look at my Mizu and all the great work that, that they do and just carry a my bottle and refill it. And because the water is super safe here, um, and that's a much better lifestyle solution. Um, but you've, you know, you, there's a there's also a whole population that's basically kind of used to just, you know, whenever thirst appears in their brain, they go through, you know, between one and thirty meters to a, a, a machine and and buy one, right? So that's that's a kind of behavioral sort of um, inbred behavior, essential behaviors built into people's um, lifestyle that needs to, that will take time to change and so yeah I, you know that that we need that sort of the change at the personal level but also at the system level and that's what you know it's not just Japan that's grappling this but I mean I would be in favor of the government sort of really pushing through laws that drive change um, and just outlawing it but it's you know that's not going to happen and it's a it's probably going to be more about various parts of that system pushing in the right direction and kind of like as a society together traveling towards it. Um, that's probably the theory of change that's going to be most relevant in Japan. But it's really, yeah, it's a great discussion. Thanks so much, James. Uh, we have so many great comments. You guys are amazing. Uh, if all soft drink bottles uh, were like in the past, you had to pay a deposit and reuse. Yes, yes, yes. Let's bring that back. Um, Darren's asking about the issue of greenwashing. We haven't touched on that yet. Yeah. Um, before we touch on that, I would love to talk a little bit about regenerative because that's one of the key words that you're using uh, for this year's publication. So the idea of people as nature, people mm. as a part of nature, with nature, not people as stewards of nature is one of the key differences, I think, between sustainability and regenerative. Is that right? Yeah, I think regener regeneration, regenerative um, sort of mindsets approaches is going to be the key concept, um, kind of going from this sort of sustainability framed era, kind of like doing less from a doing less good to a doing, um, sorry, from a doing less harm to a doing more good kind of mindset. Um, and it does, um, I think the work, let's say in the book Regeneration by Paul Hawken and um, and all the contributors to that, 
this idea that you know we've kind of ended up imagining ourselves as not part of nature and that's kind of inherent in it that we are you know we are a biological life we depend on other biological life um, and essentially regeneration as a concept is to adopt systems and models that um, through the their very sort of the, how they work um, they regenerate life which means creating more diverse life and creating essentially better conditions for the life itself um, and applying that let's say to a business model with a you know that depends on an agricultural supply chain um, it's quite tangible or intuitive because you can say okay that that agricultural system is either a monocultural input based um, disaster that's putting loads of um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and loads of poisonous chemicals into our in, into the rivers and, and land um, so that needs to become regenerative which means a more complex system that actually creates more life and more diversity and supports biodiversity as well as providing the yields to go into our into, into our products that humans can eat the the it also applies to you know to our lives um, not necessarily in just sort of uh, you know, procreation and making more children, but actually make, making our lives um, closer to nature, um, more directly embedded in natural systems, um, us understanding our interdependence with other, with other biology and other um, sort of complex um, environments and ecologies, um, but also our, you know, our own lives as um, if, when it comes to being well-being on a personal level to being um part of enriching communities being able to actually contribute to those and, and have the that word yo-yo that kind of um emotional and um so lifestyle capacity to actually give back and be part of a you know more of a um of, a, of reciprocity with communities and other um sort of social structures that's that's really key to this because you know we've ended up in a place you know which which doesn't look like that and where we are very separate separated from these systems and we we don't feel on a daily level our interdependence with biological systems so regeneration is a concept that you know we're really keen doesn't just become a kind of the next buzzword is misunderstood kind of abused and ends up not being this you know really important concept that we can use as a leverage point for um for change um that's part of the reason that we've we're using it um, and we think it applies you know really sort of uh, well to this this what Japanese companies can do and their role as employers and, and investors in um, future growth and change so yeah it does it makes a lot of sense yeah awesome very important um, that we also give credit to our indigenous knowledge you know and way way back uh, through generations I was talking with a, a Buddhist a uh, monk expert the other day and he's talking about the same concept of people as a part of nature we are included in our environment we are equals uh we are not stewards so this you know is ancient philosophies um that we yeah. need to bring back right these are great ideas yeah i mean that idea of sort of kin um you know, kith and kin that we've if um the that sort of indigenous wisdom that where you don't see non-human life as as other you see them as kin and that you know that there isn't this separation um i mean without it, it that can feel a long way away from some you know from life in tokyo where you know you probably don't touch anything organic <laughs> other than the food from the refrigerator like in a week right for most people um uh, organic as in like you know you know you're walking on pavements you're touching metal etc um and so kind of like there's that rewilding movement of re rewilding our lives actually one of the things that we've been doing like within the the fabric community with composting is like seeing that actually through the food that we eat and the waste that we create from that you can like spawn these these amazing creatures and then they they can create something which then is like just gardener's gold, they call it the kind of uh, the castings from um, a worm bin is is just am amazing for growing other things like more food. But also um, there's lots of other ways that you can connect to that, like, say, fermentation. You know, we are we are, all life basically sits on the base of the pyramid is back is bacteria and, you know, enzymes, and you know, yeast enzymes and those things that are creating so much of Japan's delicious 
food cuisine and yeah there's umami flavors you know are kin the microbes right so doing um that kind of um, fermentation just for fun and eat, like creating stuff that's nice to eat um we've just got a cobbler batch going in the, in the company um so these things are like you know i think that um you know again i'm leaning on so many um the wisdom of so many uh, great authors that i've read here but you know that food the idea of sharing food making it together and sharing it together is um it's sort of almost def defining of the human species the human condition and um that's one of the reasons that food became our focus for last year's one don't forget you can download those ones from our website as well um that actually you know food is 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 an incredible opportunity for us to use our agency as as impl as uh, consumers but also sort of to reconnect if we make the right decisions there with like local supply chains human relationships with farmers that we've actually met um sort of using traditional practices avoiding lots of packaging that's the sort of you know and then sharing the food together and using it as a vehicle for community and shared knowledge it, we have an, that's an incredible opportunity for um for ch the kind of change that's needed um and it can then kind of those same principles can roll over into other areas of our lives as well um so big yeah, as you can tell, Fabric, we're big into big into food and the importance of food at many levels. <laughs> well, it's, I think it's key to everyone's happiness and well-being, for sure. Uh, thank you so much, James. That is our time. No way! That was so yes, <laughs> yes. We've we've talked to so many different topics uh, inside your report. There's also so many amazing topics. So I've added the link to your website one more time. Uh, if you are free on the 30th, please make your way to that amazing symposium uh, Fabric is organizing. And uh, you can download your own copy with all the data that we've been talking about in this show uh, from the link as well. Thank you so much, James. So just quickly about the event. It's at a place called Soil, appropriately enough. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, but you, you can't just wander down there. I'm afraid that it's quite a, in terms of a capacity, we would do need you to go to the Peertix links and, and sign up there in order to make sure that you can come. But we'd love to see you. Yeah, Thanks definitely so pre-register. Don't Thanks just show so up. Thanks so much, Joy. You're an <laughs> absolute star. Thanks so much for everything you do for this community and, and this change here in Japan. Connect, like you've helped me connect with interesting people and you're doing that all the time. So congratulations on the success of your show. Thanks. Thank to you. I think you're number 455 for the interviews. Can you it's believe crazy. it? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what you do. Oh, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Well, thank you, James. And I'm hoping to make it up there on the 30th myself and uh, hear all these amazing speakers and be a part of the positivity that you're promoting in Tokyo and around Japan. Thank you. Please, please. We'd love to have you. Thanks so much, Joy. Great. And thank you, big thanks for all the amazing comments, all the audience today. You guys were wonderful. I love all the insights and uh, questions that you had. And if we didn't have time to address them live, we'll comment below. So thanks Absolutely. so much for joining. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for the comments and uh, interesting discussion topics from, from everyone out there. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.